Our very own Kelly Jo Fuller will be speaking to us today. She was born and raised right here in Marshall County. When she started dating her husband, Jason, in 1998, they both lived at nearby, in nearby Lewisburg at the time, but worshipped here in Chapel Hill. By the way, Jason and I grew up together here in the church since we were just kids. Little did I know this girl, Jason, would soon marry, would turn out to be one of my very best friends. In 2002, Kelly Jo stepped foot into Chapel Hill Elementary School where she would teach for the next five years. This new friend of mine now worked in the same building as I did and we attended worship together every week. I started to realize then how special this young lady was and that I wanted to call her my friend. A year later in 2003, she married Jason, right here where I'm standing. Over the course of the next two to three years, Kelly Doe and I had a friendship that blossomed. We took trips together, we still work together, we continue to worship together, and most of all, we talked about one of our biggest dreams, becoming mommies together. We shared the same hopes and dreams, it seemed, and she was a true friend to me in some very trying times in my life. She, she now has a son, Kason, and daughter, Anna Claire, and I had the privilege of teaching both of her sweet children in kindergarten. Our children are now friends as well, and I'm so lucky to share a friendship with her. Our adventures just keep growing every year. Sometimes you just have that friend that you literally go through blood, sweat, and tears with, and she's definitely that friend to me. I'm very blessed by her and her family, and they hold a very special place in my heart. And it is my honor to present to you today, Kelly Jo Fuller. Good morning. One of the things I said before I came was, you know, if I can make it without crying. And my husband said, why would you cry? And I said, because that's just what women do. So we got that part out of the way. Thank you, Jessica, for your sweet words. Well, first of all, I'm very excited about being here today, and I'm very humbled to be here this morning. And I will say, Brittany, wherever you are, Isaac makes this look so easy. Um, every, every time, that's what I told him as I was preparing. Isaac, you make that look so easy. <clears throat> But all of you are um, not only an encouragement to me today, but you are an encouragement to each one of the ladies sitting beside you, whether you realize it or not. So let us begin. Our topic today is if the shoe fits. That's a phrase we're probably all very familiar with, but how are we going to apply that to our lesson today? Um, we're going to be reading our Bible text from Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. So if you'd like to be turning there. So analyzing and comparing our lives to a shoe kind of inspired me, and I hope that it does you. But it's my hope that you will become a better Christian, and it's not just some whimsical idea of mine that doesn't motivate you. Well, once there was a preacher, of course you have to start out with a joke, right? Once there was a preacher that preached a sermon on a peanut. It was a very interesting lesson, but its inspirations were lacking. So one of the people from his congregation, when they were leaving, said, Interesting sermon. I've learned a lot from a nut. <laughs> so this study today may seem a little nutty, but hopefully you'll find it motivating and may everything here today be in accordance to God's will and glorify Him and motivate us as Christians and lift one another up. If you would, bow your heads as we pray. Dear Father, thank you for blessing us today with the health to wake up and be able to come today. Thank you also for the zeal that each lady has here today to learn about your word. Please help me to remember the things that I've studied and be able to deliver it in a way that is an inspiration to each one here. We want to lift up those that are sick and not able to be with us. We also pray for those who may be hurting or going through some difficult times in life. May we be an encourager and lift each other around us up. We pray that as we examine our lives and study your word, that everything we do today will be in accordance to your will and bring glory and honor to you. We also ask for your strength and guidance to lead us to be the people you want us to be. 
Please forgive us when we do wrong. Thank you most of all for your word to live by and the sacrifice of your Holy Son. We thank you for the hope that we have to live with you one day in heaven. And it's in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. Here we're familiar with this passage, the whole armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So we could spend the entire time talking about different shoes because there's not too many ladies who don't love a pair of shoes, right? You probably have numerous pair of shoes in your closet. Now, some people may say, well, my husband outdoes me. Um, so men do like shoes as well. But shoes are something that we can all relate to, something that we have probably lots of in variety. So we have tennis shoes, high heels, boots, flip-flops, skates, slippers, cleats, all of these are all very, very different, but yet they're all still shoes. All of us are the same way. We are very, very different, but yet we are all still people. We have tall people, short people, blue eyes, brown eyes, long hair, short hair. All of us are still made from God. We're going to focus today a little bit on souls. We're going to talk about souls, S-O-L-E-S, -E and souls, the souls that we have, S-O-U-L-S. -S. So as we think about that, I would like for you to just focus for a moment and think about our souls of our shoe. So think about the shoe. If the sole of your shoe is completely worn out, you're probably done with that pair of shoes, right? They're not going to serve their purpose. So the most important part of the shoe is the soul. And the most important part of our life is our soul, S-O-U-L. The soul of the shoe, what's the job of the soul of the shoe? Well, that soul of the shoe is going to take you somewhere. It has a purpose, and the purpose is it's going to take you somewhere. And the same with our soul. Eventually, it's going to take us somewhere. So shoes have been compared to human life long before today. I can't take the credit for being the first one that has made this comparison. So I'm going to go over a few sayings that you may be familiar with. If the shoe fits, wear it. I'd hate to be in her shoes. You don't know what someone's going through until you walked a mile in their shoes. Those are some hard shoes to feel. Even at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., they have an exhibit there using shoes. And there's a big mound of shoes, and that's used to simply to, to um, represent lives lost during the Holocaust. The country song was sung by George Jones, Who's Gonna Fill Their Shoes? This refers to country music legends that have made it big in the industry, but won't be alive forever. In Ephesians 6.15, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Can we say 
that we have that true peace and that we're ready to proclaim the gospel to others. Shoes also played a part in many Bible stories that you're familiar with. In Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son, the father commanded that a robe be brought, a ring be put on his finger, and shoes be put on his feet. In Luke 3, John declared that he was not worthy to loosen the latchet of the shoe of the Messiah. In an Old Testament reference, in Exodus 12, verse 11, the children of Israel were told to have their shoes upon their feet, ready to leave Egypt. And in Exodus 3, God told Moses to take off his shoes at the burning bush, for the ground was holy. So what kind of shoes does God want a Christian to wear? According to Ephesians 6 that we just read, the footwear of the gospel of peace. So in this lesson today, we're going to use shoes as an illustration of our lives and take a look at the shoes that we're wearing daily. So think about buying a pair of shoes, something that we probably as ladies all take delight in. If somebody handed you money and said, here, just go buy a pair of shoes, probably bring a smile to probably all of our faces. But it's a process. For some of us, it's pretty easy. For others, not so easy. So throughout this lesson, we're going to think about the process and the questions you might ask yourself when trying to find the right pair of shoes. A sole purpose. Shoes have a purpose, and you don't need shoes if you're not planning to go somewhere. If you're like me, when I get home, one of the first things I do is kick my shoes off because I don't plan on going anywhere. But one of the last things you do before you leave the house, if you're planning to go somewhere, is to put on some shoes. So shoes are made if you're planning to go somewhere. Shoes, though, are not exactly one size fits all. <coughs> When you put on a pair of shoes, you're planning to go somewhere, but where exactly is that sole of the shoe, where is it planning on taking you? So let's think about a few different types of shoes and why a certain type of shoe is needed for a certain job or task. A fireman. A fireman needs a certain type of shoes, safety boots to protect their feet during, maybe during a fire. An athlete, they need a certain pair of shoes for extended use and lots of cushioning. A construction worker, steel-toed shoes to protect their feet from nails, heavy objects. A soldier, boots to wear in the battlefield. A scuba diver, flippers to use. Of course, they have to float. An ice skater, they have to have their skates or they're unable to perform. So what's our purpose? God has a plan for me. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for all of us. In Ephesians 2.10, we read that we are created in His image. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His craftsmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He made the preparation, and he's leaving it up to us to walk in them. So every Christian has a purpose, and that should give us comfort and encourage all of us. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. We read in Isaiah 49, God has a plan for me, and that gives me peace. Maybe I'm the fearful servant. Maybe I've even buried my talent in the ground. Maybe I'm not being the woman that God intended me to be because I'm afraid. What, what if somebody laughs at me? What if somebody thinks I'm stupid? What if I don't really have the talent that I think God gave me? Well, what if, what if see how we continue to fret? And I could have said that a thousand times over before coming up here today. Oh, I just don't think I can do it. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Think about Noah in Genesis chapter 6. Folks, they'd never seen rain. Not like us who've seen rain like every day for the last 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> but they'd never seen rain. And Moses, I mean, then Noah is building an ark. What about Moses? When he was asked to lead the people of Israel, he said, I can't speak. But God had a plan. 
God makes us as different as snowflakes. Just as pure, He washes us clean with the blood of His Son. Now, it is up to us to be who He wants us to be in this world. He tells us to be in this world, but not of this world. Ladies, that's something that all of us struggle with, to be not of this world. He wants us to be Christian teachers, Christian bosses, Christian grandmothers, Christian wives, Christian waitresses, Christian whatever we're doing, Christian friends. What does that mean? It means I am to let my Christian identity permeate my every single day. I must let my Christian identity challenge me to use the talents that the Lord gave me. I must remember that I am a Christian and that whatever I face, I must remember His words. Do not be afraid, little flock, in Luke 12. It is I, be not afraid, John 6. Take heart and do not be afraid, in Matthew 14. If you know me, you know my Father. He tells us repeatedly, do not be afraid. Why are we afraid? Do not be afraid. I must let the Christian identity challenge me to use the talents the Lord gave me. He's planted our talents. And when we say talents, ladies, we are all talented. No, you just don't know me. I'm not, I don't have any talents. No, 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 no. All of us have talents. Some of our talents may just be thought, being thoughtful. Whether you're sending a card, you're sending a random text for someone on a special day. Many of you here today I know are thoughtful, and that doesn't cost us a thing. No, that may not be a talent that, that you're going to have your name on a billboard or you're going to be, you know, you're going to be famous for but you will be one day. So a talent is, is use your own interpretation of talent. God's idea of talent and the world's, um, world's idea of talent, completely two different things. We don't care what the world thinks, but we care what God thinks. And we need to be lifting our Christian sisters up. I guarantee you today, sitting beside you, to the left, to the right, in front of you, behind you, someone today will benefit from your talent if you use them. And I've already said one of the two things I was worried about today was the clicker and crying. So I got the crying out of the way, so the clicker. So if I'm going too fast, somebody give me the eye. And if I'm going too slow and I haven't moved it, do the same. I'm counting on Anna Claire for that. <laughs> All right. So you go to buy a pair of shoes. First, you had to decide what was the purpose of the shoes. What did I need the shoes for? Because if you're going to be running, you're going to pick out a different pair of shoes than you're going to wear, say, just to an event that you're going to wear your shoes for a short period of time. So you picked out, you've decided, you've already declared which type of shoe, what's the purpose of the shoe. And then you've got to decide that there's a lot of different looks just in our lives today. So then you decide which one looks the best. What is the look of the shoe and how important is that? Well, like today, the decorations, ladies, you all that decorated, especially the ladies that worked so hard on the decorations and the food today, um, you've done an excellent job. But that's not our focus today. The look is great. The look is, is inspiring. It ties our whole theme together. But that's not our focus today. And don't you think we do that sometimes with our lives? We focus more on the look than the true meaning Sometimes we put more importance on the appearance than the fit because we want to fit in. The appearance of our outward being, how others perceive us, our actions. But you just remember, a smiling face does not necessarily mean a happy person. So are you deceiving others by your look? Or are others not letting you in because of their look? 
Sarah read a while ago, um, Romans 12. This completely goes against the world's aim in life. They want us to be of the world, not just in it. Satan is prowling around alive every day, and we all are being tempted. But do not be conformed to the world. If you would, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 13 through chapter 11, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. No temptation. Sorry. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offenses to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I found this. Um, I, I couldn't find who, who to give credit to, but I found this quote during my study, and I thought that this really put things in perspective for all of us. Never let the brand name on your shoes become more important than the one who is guiding your footsteps. That's easy to do for all of us. That's something that all of us need a reminder Never let the brand name on your shoes become more important than the one who is guiding your footsteps. You can't enjoy something if your feet are killing you, right? You can't focus. Your feet are dying, and you can't think about another thing. We've all been there. You've gotten those shoes before, and they matched your outfit, and you got to where you were going, and you didn't enjoy yourself. Why? Because your feet were killing you. You couldn't even focus. I will say I've been there. And I'm going to tell you a, a quick little story about myself. And then we're going to see why I shared that story with you. But once I was going on a trip and I needed um, a pair of shoes to match an outfit, of course. So I bought a pair of shoes. They matched. They looked good. I was good to go. Packed my bags. Got on the plane. Went. Got to where I was going. When I, did I mention it was a once in a trip? Once in a lifetime trip. And had great company with me. Those of which are here today. I won't name them out loud. I was more worried about my appearance than the fit, so I get blocks away from the hotel, get to where we're going, and I can hardly enjoy myself because why? My feet are killing me. And on the way back, not only were my feet hurting, we've gone, we've taken it a whole nother step. They're bleeding. My feet are bleeding. My feet are, you know, it's rubbed. I, I now have blood. I was in, I was in pain. Literally, I was in pain. And I had this really, really amazing friend who said, "I'll swap shoes with you so you can make it back." And I'm like, "Okay." A, she sees they cause blood. And she still is willing to do this. At this point, I'm, I'm desperate. And luckily, we wore, we wore the same size shoes. And she said, here, I'll trade shoes with you. So I took her up on it. I took her up on it. So I was able to make it back. Now, what does this story have to do with my lesson today? Well, there's two points I'd like to make. The first, I obviously put more focus on the appearance than the fit, and guess what happened? It caused pain. Don't you think we do that sometimes in our lives? We actually cause put pain on ourselves because we put more appearance, put more focus on the appearance than the fit. And secondly, my friend showed compassion. Now, that's compassion. You know, you can say, man, I'm sorry, your feet are hurting. Hate it for you. You want a Band-Aid? That'll make it better. Nope, that's not 
what she did. She said, you know, I know they're hurt. Here, just let me swap shoes with you. I will forever be grateful to her for that. Compassion is taking pain upon yourself when someone else is hurting. And you feel compassionate about doing something about the situation. So maybe you've had a time in your life when you were in pain. And maybe even to the point of bleeding, so to speak. And you maybe had a friend who showed you compassion, but they couldn't trade shoes with you because it was a walk you had to make. Or maybe you've been in those uncomfortable shoes and you needed a friend. And you were searching for a friend. Believe it or not, we've all had that friend. Jesus Christ has walked in our uncomfortable shoes on this earth, tempted and tried, <coughs> carried his own cross, and as bad as my feet were hurting, I know nothing about the pain he had. So why should we be compassionate? Christ was compassionate. Friendship is a great blessing. And Jesus is all of our friends. But are you the generous friend that I told about in my story? Would you have done that? Compassion took Jesus to the cross. So think about this for a moment. This puts it a little bit into perspective, a little bit better for us. Sit there and ask yourself in a situation, you know, what if her story was my story? What if her shoes were my shoes? Whether that be health problems, financial problems, marital problems, everyone in here today has a story. And your story may not be a story that, that is full of heartache and you've had lots of trials. You may be smooth sailing. Well, you better hold on because your time's coming. And you will understand when you've walked in their shoes. So we should be full of love and compassion. We should love the Lord with all our heart. And if we do that, we should also love our neighbor as ourself. Now, knowing those passages and living them out, it's a little bit different ball game, right? But that's why we're given those times, those trials, those tests, so that we're given the opportunity to live it out. All right, moving on to the fit. So you've determined the purpose of the shoes. You've decided on the look of the shoe. The next thing you do is you try on the shoe to determine the fit, right? You put your foot in it and you try to determine the fit. The fit. So here we're going to talk about sidestepping the potential damage to our souls. Because if you don't have the right fit, you're going to have some damage to your foot, possibly. Um, I, I can't even begin to say the word, but some of you I know have it. The planner flush la 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 lita stuff. Those people say that stuff is real. Do you know what causes that? I'm not an orthopedic foot doctor, but I've read several things that say sometimes the shoes you have worn can actually cause that. So sometimes, little do we know, it's subtle, it happens over time, it causes damage to our souls. Don't you think sometimes that sneaks in our lives and little by little, sometimes our choices can make damage to our souls? So in our lives, there's lots of things you can do with the wrong size. Okay, a belt. You can wear a belt that's too big, right? All you got to do is just put it, you know, the last loop or loop it around. Pants, ladies, we can wear pants that are a little bit too snug, right? You lay on the bed, you suck it in, you squeeze. Y'all have done that before. A shirt that's too big. You can wear a shirt that's too big. But if our feet are hurting, ladies... We don't have on the right shoes. Everything's out of sorts. And aren't our lives much the same? If our life isn't right with God, everything may seem out of sorts. So it's important to find the right shoes that fit just right. The fit of the shoe is far more important than how it looks. Think about a marathon runner. 
A marathon runner, when they're running a race, they don't care if their shoes are neon green. They don't care what their shoes look like, but they have to fit because they're going to be in those for a long time, and they have a goal to reach. They can't wear those if they have holes in them. They're not going to be able to finish their race, and we can't finish our race and receive our ultimate prize either if we're not wearing the right shoes. When was the last time you looked at the sole of your shoe? Maybe never. Probably at least not often. When was the last time we looked at our souls? S-O-U-L. The soul of our life. Do we take time to do this or do we spend more time on the appearance? <clears throat> if the shoe fits, we're good to go. But if it doesn't, it can cause pain, blisters, and even bleed and cause permanent damage. <clears throat> As Christians, if we're living a life that looks good and matches our outward being, but it doesn't actually fit who we are, we're in trouble. We can damage ourselves, and guess what else? We can actually damage others and mislead them and even suffer from pretending to be someone we're not. So wouldn't you agree that finding the right fit comes with spiritual maturity? Sometimes when we're young, you know, we're, we're resilient. We don't think anything's going to happen to us, and we're going to live forever until that moment that something shakes us up. A new pair of shoes can be compared to a new babe in Christ. Spotless. You get a new pair of white shoes, you know, and there they look great. And then all of a sudden you just step in that mud puddle. Or, or in my case, sometimes I have little feet that get near me and they don't feel anything under them and they just stomp and you have to say did you not feel that feel what that was my toe and then you've got this nice little smudgy spot on there but you know what we don't throw those new shoes away just because we got a little dirt on them right Christ doesn't do that to us either we may have a few spots in our lives but we're able if we're in Christ we're able to remove those spots through forgiveness, through prayer, through repentance. So, I've done some research, and believe it or not, there are real shoe fitters. Some of you of another generation remember going to a shoe department, and there would actually be a real live person, and they would come out and say, can I help you? And you'd tell them what size shoe you needed, and they would bring it out, and they would actually put it on your feet. And then they would... They would feel for you. They would tell you to walk around. You know, may I help you with anything else? Have any of you seen those people recently? <laughs> if you're like me, I go into a store searching for someone just to ask if, if I could get a pair of shoes to try on. <laughs> and then guess what? I become the shoe fitter. And I'm on my knees with my children. Or maybe you've been the young mom who, who maybe went into the store there was a store that used to be open called Stride Right. And believe it or not, they, they, would, they would actually fit your screaming child. And you would go in and they'd say, what size? And you'd 11. And then they would put a, couldn't get an 11 on your child's foot. And then all of a sudden you'd walk out the, the door and, and your child's wearing a one. And you're like, oh, great. I feel like mother of the year. They've been wearing shoes too little the whole time. Yes, that actually happened to me. Some of you are laughing. It probably has happened to you too. But the shoe fitters, they say there's four areas of buying the wrong size shoe. There's real, real study, studiers who have studied this. One thing is, is a lot of times we buy the wrong size shoe. Sometimes we buy a shoe that is not the right shape for our foot. Sometimes we don't leave room for impact, and sometimes we buy shoes that don't have support in them. And in the same way, when we allow our emotions, the world, our family, or friends to rule our lives rather than relying on the Lord's guidance first and foremost, we find ourselves wearing the wrong shoes and risking permanent damage to our lives. So we're going to take a look at how we can do better with the fit. 
this size. So the shoe fitters tell us that sometimes we buy the wrong size shoe. And you, you may be thinking, I've worn a size, you know, nine forever. I know what size shoe I wear. Well, we can avoid damaging our feet or our lives. The shoe fitters say our feet. I say our lives. By seeking the Lord in prayer, worshiping, studying His Word, slowing down, ladies, slowing down. I'm speaking to myself. Listening, paying attention. So, assuming the wrong size shoe, how do the shoe fitters say we work around that? Well, they say have your foot measured every year because your foot can actually change over time. I've recently just experienced this. How can that apply to our soul solution? Assuming the wrong fit. Don't we sometimes assume the wrong fit? We think we belong somewhere, but we don't. Or we think we've, we've, we've always done this, and this is what I've always done, so I know that's what I'm supposed to do. Oh, I can't do that. I, there's no way I could do that. Ladies, we should check our life for spiritual growth and maybe take a spiritual inventory. As Christians, the Lord promises to continuously mature us and grow us to be more like Him. So since God allows daily growth, we should pay attention to our growth rather than assuming we're supposed to do what we've always done. Our fit could be the same, but it could be quite different. The shape. Shoe fitters say that shoes are actually bought. When you buy the shoe, you should consider the shape of your foot. If you're like me, I thought everybody's foot kind of looked the same. Apparently not. But how can that apply to our soul? Sometimes we do things that are completely the wrong shape for us. And the sole solution for that, there is only one you. God has equipped you uniquely for His purposes, and if it doesn't feel right, chances are it's not right. You have a purpose that only you can feel. God will not call you into something that requires you to be someone that you're not. I'm going to repeat that. God will not call you in to something that requires you to be someone that you're not. Impact. Some people don't leave room for impact. What does that mean? Well, to shoe fitters say that when you actually walk, your foot's going to spread out and you need to allow for that impact as you walk and your foot to spread out. Our sole solution for that, we need to also allow for impact. We need to make time in our lives to prepare for the trials that will come. There will be trials to come. Have you parents ever given you the advice, you know, principals, teachers, to give the advice, prepare yourself for a situation before you get in it so you know how you will react. Ever heard that before? I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think we in our Christian lives should do the same. If we prepare for the trials before they ever arise, if we know how, no, you, you can't know how you're going to handle a, a devastating, you know, news or um, a very trying time, but we can know what direction we're going to turn. Prepare for trials in advance that will impact our lives. Support. Actually, I'm guilty of this, and I bet a lot of you are about to be guilty of this since the weather's going to be warming up. We're going to get those flip-flops on as soon as we can. A lot of times we don't have support. So they say shoe people purchasing shoes a lot of times don't purchase shoes with support. In our soul, our soul solution, 
we need to inspect our lives for support. Do we have the spiritual support we need to face the trials? Are we looking to the world for support? Or are we looking to God's word and to our church family? So now we've picked out our pair of shoes. We know what the purpose of the shoe is, the purpose of the shoe. We know that we've selected different shoes. We've looked at the different looks of the shoe. We've talked about the different look. We've talked about the fit of the shoe. So we need to examine our lives and find out if our shoes are fitting. But after we try on the shoe and we put the shoe on, our next step is to do what? You walk. You take a step. So we're going to take a few moments restroom break and then we're going to come back and we're going to take a few steps in those shoes. All right, so where were we? We picked out our pair of shoes that we knew what kind of shoes we needed. We decided on the look. We've determined or hope we've determined the fit. And then we need to take a few steps. We need to try those shoes out. So this part of the lesson is called Each Step I Take. Each Step I Take. We read in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, Walk by faith, not by sight. That's an easy passage to read, but not so easy to to live. Walk by faith, not by sight. So to make that a little bit more personal, I want you to say to yourself, I will walk by faith even when I cannot see. I will walk by faith even when I cannot see. That makes it a little bit more personal. <laughs> It makes it a little bit more real. I think, um, I think a lot of us, it's so easy to read our scriptures and to know our scriptures, but to live those scriptures is a little bit more trying. Another quote I found during my study, steps of faith are made to be taken, not prayed about forever, and never acted upon. Steps of faith are made to be taken, not prayed about forever, and never acted upon. Have you ever found a perfect pair of shoes? You purchased them, you brought them home, put them in your closet, but you never wore them. Yep. Unused purchases, they're not only a waste of money and time, but they also become a constant reminder of what might have been. So shoes are made to be worn, not put in a closet to rot, and our faith is the same way. It is... We pray about our faith, but if we're not given those opportunities to allow our faith to grow and to act upon, then our prayer was heard, and maybe those things were given to us, but it's up to us to be able to take those steps. And let me tell you, I said that a few hundred times before today. <laughs> So we are to take positive steps in the right direction. Positive steps in the right direction. Ladies, we as Christians are supposed to be the happiest people on earth. You may be loaded down with a day and you just think not one more thing can go wrong and then all of a sudden 
It happens. We call that our breaking point, right? We just fall apart. But it can always be worse. If we drown ourselves in a pity party, we're going to be in a pity party. But if we look around, remember what we said, what if her shoes were my shoes? I actually talked to somebody recently um, about cancer treatments, and it was someone who had gone through chemo at a very young age, a young mom, and I'll go and tell you the end of the story. She's battled it and done great and been cancer-free, so no tears. But during her battle, she was sick. She lost all her hair. But she said she walked into her chemo treatments and she walked out of her chemo treatments. That may sound simple to you, but she said, I sat alongside people who came in walking and came out in a wheelchair or unable to finish their treatments. And she said, I knew then I was blessed and she kept things in perspective. And when she said that to me, I thought, wow. You know, you're, you're sitting there receiving something that you think may be making you sick, but may be saving your life all at the same time. I mean, how much, you know, m many of you here have been through it, are going through it. And she said, I was blessed. I walked in. I walked out. I continued, and there were so many people that I was I was much better off than they were. And I just thought, that put things into perspective to me. She remained positive, and how easy it is. We all have trials, and how easy it is to focus on ourselves and our heartache when actually, if we will fo refocus our attention on someone else, it's going to actually help you in return. So stay positive and keep that in the right direction in Philippians 2.14. Do all things without grumbling and complaining. That's tough. Sometimes we have to stop our tongues. I'll be the first to say it's sometimes you just you got to grumble. You let it out and then you say, I wonder who I said that in front of. You know, are you being the positive impact on others that we should be? God is always leading us. Each step I take, God is always leading us. Jesus says God has us by the hand and no one can snatch us out of his hand in John 10, 29. That's you and me. Let not your hearts be troubled in John 14, 1, means that I can believe God is in control. God is in control. I struggle with that one. I like to plan. I like to have everything laid out according to what, you know, most of us women, you plan. You do the planning. Right? You plan what you're going to do for the day. You plan what you're having for supper. You plan. You have to plan at the grocery store. You have to plan financially. So a lot of us, I think as women, struggle with this because we can turn it all over. We don't have to always be the one in control. And when we do that, it's going to give us a sense of peace. If I want peace and joy, I must believe that He is the giver of peace and joy. And I must think, study, grow, pray, and make those daily applications in my life. So we've tried the shoe on. We've taken a few steps around the store. And then it comes down to the price. This is always the bull. This right here is always the point for me. If you know me very well, I'm pretty cheap. <laughs> I like to get more for my money. The cost. So it comes down to how much will this cost me? How much will I pay? We, our, our bill's already been paid for. Christ paid the price on the cross. Ladies, in 2016, men spent $26.2 billion on shoes. Men. $26.2 billion on shoes. And women spent, you guessed it, more than men. Women spent $30 billion on shoes. On shoes. 
that you're going to sell in a yard sale or give to Goodwill later. <laughs> if we invest billions of dollars in our souls, S-O-L-E-S, in our shoes, what will we invest in our souls, S-O-U-L-S? So we've already had the tears. Now the clicker's not working. <laughs> Loana. Thank you. You can go ahead. There we go. We don't have to pay. Christ has already paid. You know, we get to the um, we get to the shoe store and you see the sign, buy one, get one. Buy one, get one half off or buy one, get one free. You want that free pair of shoes, but you don't want to pay for the first one at regular price, right? So what if someone else went up and said, I just want one. I don't, I don't really need two. Well, that's kind of what's happened here. Christ has already paid the price for our souls. He's already gone to the checkout. He's already paid for it. Our souls have been given to us at His expense. However, there's always an exception. God has replaced the responsibility on us to keep His commandments. Jesus paid the debt, but we are to keep His commandments. We are responsible for keeping His commandments, and the first being we are to love God, then we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And ladies, that love is going to permeate through our every day. You may be thinking, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to get out. I'm not able to go too many places. Or my finances, my finances are really, really, you know, small. I, I have a really tight budget. I, I can't afford a lot to buy people those things. Ladies, that's being of the world. I'm guilty of that as, as well. But a simple thought a simple prayer, those things don't cost money. They don't cost anything, but they are the best gift that you can give a sister or a brother or your children, anyone. Those things are free. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So this brings us to the cost. So we know we can afford it. Which shoe am I? We're going to look at a few different types of shoes, and we're going to compare um, these shoes to our everyday life. Now, here we're going to be discussing our work in the Lord's church, not in our secular lives, in our secular jobs and willingness to work, because some of us are hard workers. But we, but we, we haven't measured our growth, and so we've just always come, maybe come and just sat, and I I can't teach a class and I sure can't do ladies day don't yeah you can say that but you can do it we need to measure our growth and we need to decide if we have the right fit and we're going to look at what shoes we're currently wearing when you go to buy new shoes I bet you don't think about the ones you normally wear because you put the new ones on your feet walk out the store and put the old ones in the box and then let them go so sometimes we may be known as hard workers at work, school, in our gardens, in our homes, but not known to our work in the church beyond just showing up or maybe even attending Bible class. Well, that's good, but that's not all God expects from us. So the average person who lives to be 70 years of age spends his time in the following fashion. 23 years sleeping, some of us more, some of us less, 19 years working at his or her profession, 9 years playing, 6 years traveling, 4 years unaccounted, 2 years dressing, and 1 year in church activities. So evidently, most of us feel that church work is not too important. But it's the only thing, and when I say church work, I, I mean living our lives the way that we have been talking about today. But it's the only thing that will last beyond this world.
before we look at the other types of shoes, um, the first type is going to be the loafer or the work shoe. But before we do that, I want you to think about this quote from Annie Flint. Christ has not hands but our hands to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in his way. He has no tongue but our tongues to tell men how he died. He has no help but our help to bring them to his side. So am I a loafer or a work shoe? So here we're discussing, remember, our work in the church. So the loafer, we know what a loafer is, right? A loafer is one who is not willing to do a lot, um, to sit around and um, not really get involved. And our work shoe we're going to use as the person who gets in there and works hard. The Bible can actually condemns laziness, but while it praises industry. Lincoln was one time asked by a lady what his family's coat of arms was, and he said, my coat of arms is a pair of rolled up sleeves. Are we that pair of rolled up sleeves when it comes to being a worker for Christ? Or am I a high heel or a low top? A high heel has to do with our attitude as a Christian, and we know, kind of know that as being haughty or proud. The attitude of the Pharisees must never make its home in our bosoms in Luke 18. It's never good for one to brag about how good he is, especially when praying to God. God knows the truth. The low-top Christian has the Spirit of Christ. Jesus had every reason to be proud. I mean, he was the chosen one. But he was born in a manger and washed the disciples' feet and died in shame. I would definitely say he was a low-top a low-top Christian is that Christian not afraid to get involved? Here's a story about a rider on a horseback. And many years ago, came across a squad of soldiers who were trying to move a heavy piece of timber. And a corporal stood by, giving loud orders to heave. But the piece of timber was a trifle too heavy for the squad. Why don't you help them? Asked the quiet man on the horse, addressing the important corporal. Me? Why, I'm a corporal. Dismounting, the stranger carefully took his place with the soldiers. Now, all together, boys, heave, he said, and the big piece of timber fell into place, and the stranger mounted his horse and addressed the corporal. The next time you have a piece of timber too big for your men to handle, corporal, send for the commander-in-chief. The horseman was George Washington. We are not greater than our master. If he had a low-top attitude, we should much more so. A low-top person is willing to humbly submit to the commands of God in Acts 2.38 or admit, I have made a mistake and repent in Acts 8.22. Am I a baby shoe? Or an overshoe. A baby shoe Christian is one who has not grown up and he's never grown into well rounded service. But an overshoe Christian is one whose faith permeates and covers his life every day. <laughs> Now 
we read about the baby shoe Christian who was given milk because they were not ready for the solid food in Hebrews 12. And then the overshoe Christian in 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 7, 5, 7, whose faith permeates over his life. Am I a Sunday shoe or an everyday shoe? Am I a Sunday shoe or an everyday shoe? Well, I'm here on Sundays. I come to church. I, I, I'm here. They're, they mark my name on the attendance, and I'm here. But the Sunday shoe Christian puts on his Christian long enough for Sunday morning services. He does not realize that Christianity was ever meant to be a Sunday, it was not meant to be a Sunday religion, but it is instructed to note that the daily duties of Christians, <coughs> we are to number one, take up our crosses daily. Take up our crosses daily in Luke 9, 23. We are to be serving others daily. Acts 6 1. We are to search the scriptures daily. Acts 17 11. We are to exhort one another daily in Hebrews 3 13. Well, but you just don't understand. I'm just really busy and I, I make time to, to be there on Sundays. Ladies, our Christian shoes should be every day. Whether we're, you know, it's, it's, I always say, I feel better to be busy. Too much idle time, you know, that brain gets to going and, and, and the best way to get that brain to stop is to focus on something else other than ourselves. Whether we are busy at work or the ballpark or at school or wherever we are or whether we're just sitting in our chair watching TV because that's all we have to do. We can at least take up our crosses daily. We can serve others daily. We can search the scriptures even if we can't do anything but sit in a chair. We can lift each other up daily, even if it's just a phone call. I guarantee you all of us pick up a phone at least once during the day. It could be a phone call. It could be a text. Am I a house shoe or a combat boot? Ladies, we all like some comfortable house shoes, right? Take those work shoes off when we get home and we want to put on those house shoes. Or am I a house shoe or a combat boot? Well, a house shoe Christian's one who wants things easy and comfortable. Is scared off by mission work or a growing program, benevolent work, or anything that might require them to get out of their box. And ladies... That fear is real. I feel ya. But you can do it. Remember, God's not laughing. God is smiling. If someone else is laughing, chances are they don't have the nerve to do what you're willing to do, whether it be to teach the two-year-old class, the three-year-old class, whether it's to, you know, take a friend to run an errand that can't drive, to take someone to a doctor's appointment. It doesn't matter what somebody else thinks. You could make all the difference. About 350 years ago, a shipload of travelers landed on a northeast coast of America, and the first year they established a town site, the next year they elected a town government, the third year the town government planned to build a road five miles westward into the wilderness, in the fourth year the people tried to impeach their government because they thought it was a waste of public funds to build a road five miles westward into the wilderness. Who needed to go there anyway? Here were people who had the vision to see 3,000 miles across an ocean and the courage to overcome great obstacles to get there. But in a few short years, they were not able to see five miles out of town. What happened? They lost their pioneering spirit and they got comfortable and decided they were okay with things the way they were. What about the children of um, Israel when they left Egypt? 
They had great excitement and anticipation, right? But it wasn't long before the unfamiliar and the unknown began to take its toll. And they just wanted to retreat back to the comfort of old surroundings and even if it did remain, mean returning to slaves. What about us? Have we lost our vision to try bold things for the Lord? Are you willing to try new things for God? Are you ready to go five miles into the wilderness and reach out to that lost person, go to that lectureship or meeting, teach that class, or minister to that hurting person? And if you do, God will be with you. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's no mention of a padded cross in the New Testament. Not comfortable, not easy, not even attractive. But a combat boot Christian is one who is willing to be a soldier in the Lord's army. If you would, turn with me to 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. Second Timothy 2, 1 through 4. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of, my, of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. So today we've talked about the process of buying a pair of shoes, something we can all relate to, but we have taken that and applied that to our lives. We've decided that we know we all have a purpose. We all have a purpose. We also have looked and we have decided that we needed the perfect look and the perfect look is never perfect. The perfect look for you may be different than your neighbor, but we're not to be as someone else, but to be an imitator of Christ. And we know the look of Christ. The fit. Are we somewhere that fits who we are? Are you somewhere that fits who you are? Or do you need to grow? Have you grown and you're, doing, you're not doing enough? You're capable of more. Each step I take, I know that it's, it can be hard, but that God is leading us. He has a plan for me. He's holding our hands. He's leading us. And we've taken a look to examine our lives to see which shoe we are. What kind of shoe are you? Do we need to make changes? Do we need to grow in faith? Do we need to repent from things we've done and turn away? Do we need to be baptized? Do we need prayers? Where is our soul going? In Colossians 3.2, we are reminded to stay focused and to set our minds on things that are above, not on things of this earth. Where are we looking towards? Did you know that heaven can be affected by you? Heaven can be affected by you. We are called to take others to heaven with us. So may each of us be a soul winner for Christ. S-O-U-L. I can't take credit for that. One of my co-workers helped me with that. May each of us be a soul winner for Christ. So if you know the will of God, put on your shoes that fit, and you're going to serve Him no matter what the obstacles may be. You know how you stand in front of the mirror, and some of you did it this morning. Do these shoes look okay? Are you sure? No, wait, how about these? If we're willing to change those shoes, we should be willing to change our souls, make changes to save our souls. Don't get to the judgment day with the shoes on that don't fit. If you're not wearing the shoes that fit right now, change them today, and you can make that commitment today. 
Saul, we have examples of Saul. Saul didn't have on shoes that fit, and he changed his shoes, and we can too. I'd like to leave us with 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your, na- your labor is not vain. May each of us put on our work shoes and be a worker for the Lord.